Okay, excellent. Well, welcome everyone. I hope you guys are doing very well this fine Monday morning. Glad to see you, uh, most of you at least. Uh, and uh, if you want to turn your web cameras, just invite to do that now. Uh, and here we have today uh, for our Chester session, uh, Mrs. Andrea Leader of the Ukrainian Catholic Eparchy of Edmonton. Uh, some of you will recall, uh, if you were with us last year uh, and the year before, uh, Mrs. Leader has been able to present uh, to us on, on a variety of different topics. And today we're happy to hear from her uh, once again. And it's always a delight. We were just chatting there earlier about uh, hearing from Bishop David and always learning something new. Uh, and so we're definitely looking forward to this as we continue on in our Advent uh, season. And so um, with that in mind, why don't we start with a word of prayer? Let's place ourselves in the presence of God. And let us begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, you who fashioned and made us in your image and likeness, you who set us upon the earth to observe the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you have made. You've given us, Lord, uh, glory through immersion into the waters of baptism, uh, through joining us to the life of your Son our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. We pray, Lord, that this light may infuse our lives, our deeds, our words. May we give witness to you, who are the true light of this world. And we give glory to you, Lord, today for this opportunity we have to gather in your holy name. We ask your blessing upon us. May you bless Mrs. Leader and her words, her presentation. May uh, the message here bear fruit in our hearts and our lives. We thank you once again for the opportunity we have to gather your name, and we ask your blessing upon us. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, well, it's always a pleasure to to have uh, Mrs. Leader uh, speak to us. Uh, where I was teaching before, uh, she was able to come in in person, and, and we were able to Pepper with all sorts of questions and uh, always, uh, always, it's always a pleasure. So, in any case, we we will we will uh, I believe uh, if this if this uh, makes sense, uh, we're going to hear from you, and then we will have a bit of opportunity for question and answers. That that sounds right, uh, Mrs. Wright. Excellent. Okay, so Mrs. Leader, the the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Dr. McClarney, and uh, glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory be forever. So. Uh, I see some of you, I, I know others are there uh, still in their jammies because they don't want to show themselves. And that's okay. I respect that. But I would encourage, um, you know, if you do have a question, I don't have access to the chat, of course, but Mrs. Wright does. And uh, I think last time what we've done in the past is I, I've spoken a little bit as Dr. McClarney has said and then uh, sometimes I might throw a question out to you but I'll try to talk and then give a little bit of time because uh, we're going to look at a couple of icons today and I know the last time you were together at least in this uh, you had Bishop David and he did speak to you about the nativity icon which is a fascinating uh, icon and it's really a uh, an amalgamation of stories put together. It's like a storyboard all together. And um, I, so knowing that that's what he did with you uh, was a couple weeks ago, I think, or whatever it was, uh, I thought, well, I would continue on the theme uh, in preparation for the nativity. So we are, uh, we are in the, as the Eastern church. So we are Ukrainian Catholic, which means we're Eastern Catholic, uh, we are in what we call the fast of St. Philip. So we don't really have Advent, even though it's like Advent. We are in a time of fasting and time of preparation. And so the feast of St. Philip begins, it is on uh, November the 14th. And then immediately on November the 15th, we enter that fasting period, that Lenten period. It's not great Lent, but it's a period of preparation for the feast. So as you know, every feast begins with a period of fasting. So as we um, 
journey to that beautiful feast, uh, we, you know, we prepare our hearts, we prepare our minds, and we kind of absorb everything that we can to to bring ourselves in um, into God's presence, but in a very special way, because uh, the feast of the nativity uh, is obviously second to the feast of the resurrection, but it's such a beautiful opportunity for us, for me anyway. Um, and I think for most of us to, to really um, encounter God in a very beautiful and uh, unique way. So, so let me begin by talking a little bit about icons. And I know many of you, maybe some of you are icon experts already. But um, just before we started the um, uh, our session here, we we're just talking about how icons are the same and they're different at the same time. So many of you have seen the icon of maybe Mary holding Jesus. Okay, you know, raise your hands. You've seen everybody's seen that icon, and they're all kind of the same. They those like they're a little bit different, but they all look more or less stylistically the same. And why is that? Well, because when we look at an icon, icons are actually theological statements. So they're not pieces of art. They are actually engagement with the divine. So think about when you read scripture. Does the Bible ever change? No, the words are there. Maybe you've got this version and this edition or whatever you've got. Okay, but the words are there. They never change. The message never changes. Though how we interpret this word, either it's Greek or Hebrew or whatever, that maybe is, is uh, up for debate. But the same is true with icons. They, uh, we read icons. So, I imagine if you've been uh, in a little session um, together with either Bishop or myself before, we learned that an icon, uh, and I see in the chat, is an icon like a stained glass window. Um, yes and no. So icons, we call them windows to the divine, okay, a way that we can encounter the divine. But what we really want to know and understand is that icons are our experiences, okay? So when we come in front of an icon, we enter into God's presence because we are communicating um, with God. We are in God's presence through what we experience when we see the icon. And an icon is made in a very special way. So it's it's uh, made in a manner, maybe that's another good session is how are icons made? Okay, that because that is quite fascinating. Um, so they're not just, we don't just start and we don't just come to it and we just put paint on. It's not like that at all. It's a very prayerful, meditative, uh, very articulate process of revelation. What, are the, what is the icon uh, expressing and how does that uh, come alive, literally, for us to engage in? So, so I just want you to keep that in mind when we talk about icons. So, um, so going back to the stained glass window, stained glass windows are beautiful because that light comes through and it tells us a story. Um, icons are that, but they are more than that. So they are actually experiencing. So much like I use this example, you, maybe you've got a, a fridge at home with a picture on it of your grandma or your best friend or, or, or you know, some, somebody that you love. Um, and when you're looking at that picture, you're experiencing that person. You're not looking at the piece of paper and the fibers of the paper and the ink on the paper. That's not what it's about. It's about that person. And you're engaging and you're encountering that person. You're, for me, my Baba, okay, or my kids, um, that kind of thing. So the same is true when we come before an icon. And then 
like I said before, it's their theological statements. So there isn't a lot of, uh, you know, kind of uh, personal um, expression put into icons. They, they have a, a rubric, if you will, certain rules. And then we should learn how to read icons, just like we learn how to read scripture. Uh, we have to learn how to read icons. So, you know, when we go into the Gospels and the Gospels maybe are built in a certain way and there's a story within a story, what does all that mean? Well, icons say the same thing for us. So we have to put our a little bit of our thinking caps on when we look at icons. So that's enough about icons. Let's look at an icon. The first icon I wanted to show you today is the icon. Um, well, actually... Let's look at it first. Let me see if I can share. Okay, everybody, say a little prayer that I can do this. Okay. We, okay. Have, we have, yes, we have faith in your Zoom abilities. Good. News. Thank you. Oh, my Zoom ability. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I'm going to use that if that's okay. My Zoom ability. So can everybody see this icon here? This is the yes. icon of Emmanuel. And that's not a surprise because if you read it here, see these letters here, they're very stylized, but this is the icon of Emmanuel. So who is Emmanuel? Well, this is an icon of Jesus. Okay. And uh, it looks very unique, right? How do we know that this is an icon of Jesus? Well, we have a few clues. Uh, first of all, we know, we read in scripture, uh, in Isaiah, that uh, Jesus is Emmanuel. So we, God with us, right? So so we know that already, that, uh, that uh, prophecy um, told us that a virgin uh, will bear a child, a son, and she will call him Emmanuel. Okay, so that part everybody agrees on. Now, uh, if you look, every icon of Jesus, and this may be old news to you, uh, some this may be new information, always has these symbols here. And does anybody know what these symbols are? Here's your chance to get, get chatty. Anybody want to throw out something out in the chat and see if we know what this is? Yes, Peter. I'm looking at it and I can see what looks like there is a cross around those. Here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So that tells us that uh, that Jesus is associated with the cross, right? Jesus died on the cross. In icons, Jesus is the only one that has a cross in his halo. And that's reminds us that Jesus died on the cross for us. Anybody else want to take a shot at these symbols here? Irina in the chat says the existing one, they're Greek letters. Very good. Yes, they're the existing one, the one who is the I am who am. So the ho on, uh, so we have um, Omega, Omicron, and Eta. I believe, are those three. So when we put them together, usually every icon of Jesus has those three symbols in the cross that Peter noted. So this is another clue. Very good. Uh, what do we have here? Well, these are initials. So these are the shorthand of Jesus Christos. So whenever we see, can I zoom in on this? Oh, wow. Look at that. Look at us zooming in. So you can see there's a little squiggle there and there's a squiggle there. That means that there are letters missing. And this is basically just Jesus name. Okay. Jesus, the Christ. All right. So, so Peter, Peter asked, is a halo made with gold? Yes. The halo is made with gold. Thank you for uh, telling me when there are people asking questions, because I can't see the chat now that I'm sharing screen. Oh, it's over there. Okay. Um, 
yeah. So when when we make icons like this, uh, I'm going to tell you that uh, I'm 99% sure that this is 24 karat gold leaf um, rubbed onto the icon itself. And um, again, there's a beautiful process that what's underneath the gold leaf, and you can actually see it kind of here, this kind of brownie red color. It's the color of earth. And underneath this gold is actually a kind of a clay. And uh, when you rub the, um, there's a whole process involved, but certainly when you rub the gold leaf on to that um, material, it kind of um, combines. It kind of I don't want to say it melts together because that's not true, but it it comes together in such a way that they become one. Okay, you can't separate it. And that's really important uh, when we talk about how icons are made. So yes, uh, 24 karat gold leaf. And if you've ever been, uh, everybody, well, some of you would be from the Edmonton area. And if you've ever been to um, St. George, Ukrainian Catholic Cathedral in Edmonton. Um, it's one of our newer churches and they finished um, their iconography in the church many years ago, but they put, um, I think, $1.2 million worth of gold leaf on the walls of the church. And that reminds us that we're in God's kingdom, the kingdom of God, when we go into an Eastern uh, church, an Eastern uh, Catholic or Orthodox church. So gold is important, very important. So thanks for pointing that out, Peter. Okay, what else do you notice about this um, icon here? What do you notice about Jesus? Anybody want to raise their hand? Anything? odd does he look normal does he kind of look normal to you <laughs> okay he's got he's got a really big really big head right he says his head looks big and it's it's like head. a baby oh this is a good one a baby and an adult at the same time yes okay two really great points why well, i got a this group is sharp this morning that's awesome so two really important points so first of all the Emmanuel icon um, depicts Jesus uh, in from the story when he's in the temple. Okay, so remember that story. He's he stays back, and Mary and Joseph are off, but he stays back and he stays in the temple, and he's uh, with with the rap. He's with the teachers and the leaders. He's, he's learning. He's sharing. He's speaking. So he has um, he's an adolescent. So he's not a baby, no, but he is not a mature man either. So that's kind of where we see him kind of situated in, in this icon here. So that makes sense. So there's no beard, right? When we see icons with men with beards, so that shows us they're, they're wise and they have wisdom. Now, the giant uh, forehead. Okay, what do you think that means? Why would there be a giant forehead? No, okay. I will tell you because he's wise. Wise. Somebody said brain, so wise. Yeah, yeah. Wise wisdom. So all of the, um, Icon, many icons will have a kind of disproportionate um, forehead size. And that just communicates to us wisdom. All right. And so you can see that even this at this early age, that Jesus is wise. So that's, those are a couple of 
very unique things about this particular icon. And uh, you don't see it here, but a lot of times this Jesus will have really, really curly hair as well. And the curls uh, tell us about um, the, the infinite wisdom, okay? Because a circle doesn't have a beginning or an end. So the uh, it, Jesus is always existing. And there is a, a continual motion of wisdom, and it's unending. Okay, so some really cool things about this icon that tell us. So we read, when we see a big forehead, we know this person has wisdom. The iconographer is communicating that to us. A couple little things before we shift to a different icon. Um, you see here, the lips are pretty pretty small. Uh, and it's not um, as prominent in this icon. But if you notice, most icons, the mouth is very tiny. The eyes are big to see, and the ears are big to listen. Okay, so what does that tell us? This is a good life skill, actually. <laughs> so speak less, see more, hear more, listen more. And that's um, what we're trying to communicate here. So listen to the word of God and uh, speak less about yourself. Okay. So I'm going to shift from this icon. So any other questions from about this icon before we move on to another one? Just uh, Irina. So Irina lives in Pennsylvania. She uh, ah. and is of the Eastern Rite and her she mentions here her whole arc, whole altar is covered with gold and icons. Beautiful. And then she also says that um, the whole thing about the forehead, that it makes sense why St. Paul has a big forehead in Eastern artwork. about the Yes. Wisdom. Yeah. yeah. St. Peter and Paul, when, when they come together, you can see they have just really, really big foreheads. So next time you look at another icon, not this one, but other icons, just look, look and see. Okay. See what see if you can notice that. All right. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing this icon and I'm going to go to a different one. So very similar. Can you all see this one? So this is an a more ancient icon. I would say yes. the other previous yes, we can see it. Yeah. The previous one was was a more modern. Uh, icon, I would say, but this one, I mean, this one really, really says it all here, right? And uh, it's notice how round his head is. That tells us something about Jesus. There's no beginning, there's no end to God and God's wisdom. It's constantly moving. And here you can see how small the mouth is how small the nose is, but how big the eyes and ears are. Okay, you see how, see how we learn something? And look, we also have those symbols here as well. And Jesus initials with the little squigglies on the top. I'm sure the squigglies have a name. I'm calling them squigglies today. Um, but uh, they're the uh, abbreviation for Christ's name. Okay, so kind of neat, kind of weird but kind of neat at the same time all right so i will stop sharing that icon and i'm going to bring up a new icon and this one is uh where is the icon hmm. <laughs> ah here it is so here we have uh another icon and this one is um so we see that icon of Emmanuel. It makes sense around Christmas, right? Because we're celebrating that God is with us, Christ, uh, uh, God with us, Emmanuel, right? That makes sense. Um, we also see this icon, and some of you may have seen this icon before, maybe not. But this is related to to the other icon, the Emmanuel icon, and it's got a few different things going on here. So first of all, you can see if I can zoom in. There we go. Um, so who do we have here? We just saw this icon, didn't we? Okay, this is Emmanuel. So I don't know who said it. Uh, I can't recall, but somebody said a 
a baby and an adult kind of combined, right? A combination. So that's precisely what we have here. And this icon is called the Virgin of the Sign or Orans. Um, and it has a couple of things. So first of all, we see Jesus here. Okay. And this really is an icon uh, about Mary. And we see, look at her hands here. She's in this position, and this is a position of prayer, right? We, we Sometimes we uh, pray like this when we pray the Our Father, for example. We put our hands like this. So she is in a position of prayer, number one. Number two, look at where Jesus is placed on her in the icon. So this, it's uh, on her torso, right? And so this tells us that she, this speaks to her motherhood, all right? That she is uh, the mother of Jesus, that she is the Theotokos. So I think maybe you've heard that word before, Theotokos, and that means God bearer or the one who gives birth to God. Okay, so that really is the one reason, uh, there are many, but that is the main reason why we honor and venerate Mary, because she has given birth to God. She has given form to that which is without form. All right. And I think this is information that you already know, but we talk about it and we say um, that her womb, and you can see that she's, maybe it's a little bit high, but generally speaking, Christ is in her womb here in the icon, and that we read her womb is wider than the heavens, wider than the heavens, because she carried him, Jesus, God, whom the heavens themselves cannot contain. So let's just think about that for a minute. We are coming to celebrate the Feast of the Incarnation. So we're coming to celebrate Jesus, God becoming human, who empties himself of his divinity to become a baby, a human baby. So God, who is beyond the heavens, become something so small, infantile, literally, through Mary. So when we talk about her womb being wider than the heavens, like just, just think of that. It's amazing. We can't even describe it, um, that she is able to do that that she is able to contain that which is beyond containing, okay? So this icon talks about that, and we see here a little bit more to that effect. So let's look at, um, I'm going to try to zoom in. Here we go. So look at what we have here for Jesus. So this is a little bit more than the other icon. We have some circles here. And these, this kind of uh, feature here, again, circle, okay? So we have that never-endingness without beginning, without end of God. But we also have, um, it's called a mandorla, a mandorla. And in some other icons, we see this very same idea, especially when we see the icon of the resurrection or the transfiguration, for example, and we see Jesus and he's in kind of a feature like this. It's, it's called an, it's like an almond shape. That is what mandorla means. 
But what's important about that, Jesus is right in the center. But what's important about that, you see the colors here. So you see kind of a blue, bluey green, I guess, blue, a darker blue, and then a really dark blue. And what does that tell us about Jesus? And remember, there's nothing for fun on icons. Everything on an icon has a meaning, okay? So the mandorla tells us about Jesus' um, divinity. So the darker we go with the color blue, and blue um, is represents the, that deep mystery of God, God who is beyond all understanding, beyond all comprehension. Um, the darkest blue represents that, but look who's right in the center, Jesus who is coming forth in human form to show us something about who God is. So do you see that beautiful contrast? The deepest, darkest mystery of God. And in some of these icons, it's almost black. It's so dark. It's just, it's so outside of our, our understanding. And yet who comes forth forward out of the middle of that darkness? Jesus in his incarnation. Isn't that awesome? Like just so awesome. Okay. All right. What else do we have here? Um, so we have Mary is the one who makes this happen. It's all Mary, right? She, she had to say yes. She was born to say yes. And she was born to be the mother of God. So we have a beautiful understanding of, of Christ's incarnation in this icon. Yes, Peter has a question. I put it in the chat also, I'm but sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I'm noticing that I can see that for Jesus's forehead, I noticed that there is a part where there is I notice how, how like there's a part where the hair where there's like a cent there's a ha the hair on the top has like two there's that part and then it has two parts with no hair next to it. Right here, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, well I would say that um that part would be his hairline. Okay. So some of us uh you know, if you were to pull your hair back, okay. Pull your hair back. You got your headphones on, but that's okay. Your hairline kind of goes like that too, or at least for some of us it does. And some of us don't have a hairline at all. <laughs> but you can see that uh, as, as men get older, sometimes their hair goes like that. So this is a, a sign of his maturity and his wisdom right? So see how the two kind of go together. He's in positioned in the icon in his mother's womb. And yet he has that wisdom of the the older uh, adult where the hairline is like that, where we see more of the forehead. And what do we know when we see forehead? Wisdom, right? Divine wisdom. So his forehead is at least half the size of his whole face here see how that is does that answer your question peter yeah yeah good good point very good point <laughs> awesome and again here you can see the mouth is small the eyes are big all right and what's he doing here with his hands he's blessing us right he's blessing us with his hand Okay, I'm going to zoom out. Um, just one more thing. Some icons show these rays, uh, these little lines. Those are rays of light. Jesus is the light of the world. And the stars here quite often will um, tell us about the cosmos, that uh, Christ is the creator of the world, of everything that is. Okay, so he's coming out of that, uh, out of his mystery, and he's coming forth into the world. Okay. Here's a great comment here to um, Andrea. So Irina says, I noticed that Mary's forehead is covered 
Is that symbolizing her humility? I would say two things. Yes, absolutely her humility. But look at look at her head. Round. And it's also very big. So if we were to take away her veil, we would see something similar. Okay. So just like Peter and Paul, for example, have those the big foreheads, so does Mary. So she also shows wisdom in her yes, right? She was wise. She knew what she had to say and she said it so uh there if we have time maybe we'll look at another icon of mary and you'll see the same thing that yes she has that very same thing and all icons of her will have a larger head like that and it will be round again round for that eternal reality okay that she embraces in her yes so we spoke about the hand positions um and so in prayer and we see that mary uh is bringing forth christ into the world she gives form to that with which is uh to him who is without form and um we see a couple of other things about her here's a really good example look at how small her mouth is so tiny so tiny and her eyes are bigger and so she is presenting jesus to us in this icon she's saying here is my son listen to him she doesn't speak but she shows us with the icon with her gestures with her eyes and remember she's looking um uh, like we look at her, right? Icons are really amazing this way. But but let her also look at you. Okay, turn it around. We look at her, but in the same manner, she is looking at you and she's telling you, here is my son. Okay, and she embodies that prayer. She is prayer. Sometimes we say she is prayer itself in this position. So a couple of more things. Um, so just like Jesus has his initials, so does Mary. So the Mary, the Theotokos, Mary, the God bearer, the mother of God. Uh, and you notice these two angels. So I'm just wondering um, if anybody has any idea why there are these two angels uh, beside Mary? Adults can chime in too. Well, it ha it has to do with uh, nobody, no takers on that. See, putting everybody on the spot. That's okay. It, it has to do with um, actually a comparison between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So in the Old Covenant, what did we see? What was that symbol in the Holy of Holies? What represented the, the Old Covenant, right? The Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, remember? And so we have that vision of the, 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 the gold. Um, we read about it in scripture, the big gold ark. And what's inside the ark? God's presence, God's words. Um, we, uh, in, the, um, in the Jewish tradition, it, we call it the mercy seat where God dwells, God's presence is there. And what is on top? Remember, you see it, the two angels on top, right? So that's how we knew where God dwells inside that Ark of the Covenant. And the symbols on top, the images are two angels on top. Well, guess what we have here? 
two angels. What does that tell us about Mary? She is the new ark, the ark of the new covenant, and she is where God dwells. So she herself embodies um, Christ, God, in giving birth to him. So you can see how this icon uh, is a mirror of the Old Testament uh, mercy seat or Ark of the Covenant. We often refer to Mary as the new Ark, which relates to the new covenant uh, that Christ establishes with us. So do you see that there? Yeah. And, and just about the colors before we there was on. a there was a comment too about uh, the angels names and arena something about cherubim and seraphim yep cherubim and seraphim so we hear about that uh, and in the eastern churches we we uh we pray that all the time that she is beyond compare more glorious than the cherubim and the seraphim and who are the cherubim and seraphim they are the angels that surround the throne of god constantly praising God, constantly giving God glory, right? So guess what? Where do we see them? She is the throne of God, Ark of the Covenant, uh, throne of God. You can see this, right? All of this in this beautiful icon here. And just about the two colors. So you notice... Mm, there's blue here and red, kind of a burgundy deep red on top. Oh, Peter has a question. Go ahead, Peter. It's not exactly a question as much as an observation. I'm looking yes. and I can see three gold things that look like crosses. These things here? Yeah. Okay, let's zoom in. Good eye, because they're quite small on this icon. So they are. They're not crosses, but they're we call it like little stars almost. Um, and um, they, you will always find them on an icon of Mary. You may not always see them in the icon, but they're always there. If especially if like Jesus is kind of like this, Jesus might be covering one of them. But these are stars always related to Mary. And they represent her virginity before, during, and after childbirth. Okay, before, during, and after childbirth. So every icon of the Theotokos, you will see these three symbols. And as I say, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, they'll be very evident and prominent as they are here, or they might be uh, covered up by some other thing but um but in this case very good observation peter thank you for pointing that out so just one comment then about the colors and you see red and blue and you see red and blue here well blue in iconography generally speaking and there are different uh, schools of thought on this but generally speaking blue is the color of humanity Okay, red is the color of divinity or royalty, or in this case, both. So what do you see here? Well, you see Jesus, he's in red, kind of a ready gold kind of color. So it's not exactly the same as this, but it's kind of a, a almost a luminescent kind of a red color. And that is supposed to show us his royalty, his divinity, okay, and his glory. Like it's supposed to try to, if this were in person, it would be way more vibrant, right? Um, but nevertheless, that's what this part is trying to communicate to us. Mary, her inner cloak closest to her body, her skin, is blue. She's human, right? But look at she puts on that divinity. She puts on that holiness when she becomes the mother of God. So um, we, we will always see her 
uh, with two colors like that, even though maybe it's not always evident in icons because some icons are older and you don't always see it pop. Uh, but this one makes it very, very clear. Okay, so can you see that? And look, divinity and humanity coming together in Mary, in the Ark of the Covenant, in um, that mercy seat, in uh, the beautiful uh, motherhood of Mary. So, good. Anything else about this icon? Because I want to show you how we see this icon in actually in church. Uh, so we can have this icon at home. This this icon, just the way I can see the shape of it here, is probably an icon, uh, a smaller icon that someone might have in the home, maybe in a chapel, something like that. But in Eastern churches, you'll see something very different. So going to stop sharing this one and start sharing another one. Hmm. Oh, where did it go? Show all windows. Oh, where did my other picture go? Hmm. Sorry, guys. This is me trying to trying to to be technical. Let me just bring up the other picture. No, let me see where my other picture is. I'm sorry. If you have any questions for me while I'm desperately searching for where my other picture went, then you can ask me a question now. Okay, I think I got it. I think I got it. So I want to go back to Zoom. Okay. What's the name of that icon with Mary that I see you is a virgin of the sign? Virgin, virgin of the sign. Okay. Yeah. There we go. And well, sometimes it's called Orans. Okay. Can you see this picture? Yes. Wow. Okay. So, wow. Right. So this is where this icon, uh, sorry about the delay there. This is where this particular icon appears in Eastern churches. So take a look at that. Um, I don't know where this church is. This looks like a newer church because I can see just kind of the architecture is a little bit uh, more modern. But nevertheless, I, I know that this is um, the altar area behind here. And so these are what we would call the royal doors. So if, and you can even see some icons here. You see that icons there? So this would be a very modern, what we would call iconostas. Uh, but behind these doors during the divine liturgy, those doors are open. And this is where the mass, quote unquote, is uh, celebrated. So the altar is behind here. And what do you see? She's huge huge presence there. So again, she is the altar. Her womb is the altar. She brings forth Christ to the world uh, where we experience him in, uh, in divinity and in uh, his body and blood when we receive the Eucharist. So, um, we her you know she is the throne of god and we see all that in these beautiful images here um so so as we journey towards uh the nativity so we we read uh in our prayers and especially during the compline of christmas eve we sing over and over and over again God is with us. Understand all you nations and be humbled. 
for God is with us. So we see all these different things kind of pointing um, to that. And Mary in her arms are open wide and she is praying for us. She is showing us her son. She is inviting us uh, to him uh, to come forward, to come to the altar, to receive her son in uh, the Eucharist. So um, when we see these symbols, these um, signs in icons, there's so much more than just tricks of the trade, right? Their engagement and they're teaching us something really, really important. So when we see this and when we move forward, God is with us. We have to just remember that that is such an amazing reality. Uh, God is with us and that is what we celebrate. That is what we're celebrating um, during the Christmas season. And that's what we're preparing for now. And we need to be humble. We come forward in all humility before the Lord. Are there any questions? I think we're out of time here, but. Where, where was that picture of like what church? I don't know where that picture uh, is from, but I would imagine that at least I would say 70 60% of Eastern churches, so Orthodox, uh, Eastern Catholic churches, that icon is prescribed to go behind the altar very purposefully. So you quite often will see that. Not always, but quite often that's what's supposed to be there. And even if you look at the icon of the Hagia Sophia uh, in, the, in Constantinople or in, in uh, Istanbul, that's what's there. So take a look. Go and Google that after and see which icon is there. So that's from very, very, very early on. And that's the same icon that is there in a different style, of course, but the same message. Mary is the gateway, right? The gateway. She's that new covenant. So, uh, Mr. Fawcett asks, is the Oron's icon of Mary related to the icon of the protection of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So They're they very similar. similar. Yeah, very similar. So the posture is the same. And in the protection, we see that cloak, right? We see that um, there's a kind of a fabric that goes across. And that fabric is like the cloak of protection. So we see that in, in both. But the posture is the same. Very good. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Yeah, there are a couple of the comments by the Byzantine church that Irina used to go to growing up had a dome with giant mosaic of God. It was beautiful. Yeah. And then Mr. Sarkos put in a picture of, of in Vagerville, Holy Trinity in Vagerville, where he grew up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there's lots of images, searches. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So just Google it. You know, when you have some spare time, uh, just icons of Mary or Virgin of the Sign or that Emmanuel icon. See what you come up with and, and learn how to read what you see. Because not just a picture. It's there for a reason. What is it telling us about our relationship with God and our growth in holiness? Any other questions or comments before Dr. McClarney closes out here? Well, uh, thank you once again, Mrs. Leader. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear from you. And uh, here in this case, as we're preparing for the great feast of the Incarnation, um, is a wonderful occasion to just further contemplate uh, the, the, the mystery of, of God taking on uh, flesh and, and dwelling amongst us. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, it looks like, Peter, one last question. Peter, is it a quick question? It's not a question. I'm just... I'm feeling, oh. I'm just thinking that, uh, I think, if, to me it feels, I'm, I was just thinking about a bit, and the Ukrainian, I think the Ukrainian Catholic Church is kind of a link between the East and, and Western churches. 
You're you're absolutely right, Peter. It's like um, we sort of have the best of both worlds between you and me, okay? Because we have the beautiful and rich history of that early church, the Orthodox Church, um, and the spirituality and the theology and all that that goes with it. Yet we are part of the Catholic Church and full communion with the Church in Rome. So I like to think we have uh, one foot on one side and one foot on the other side, and we're right in the middle. And we enjoy both. We breathe with both lungs, right? We hear that. So very good. Very good. So perhaps uh, everyone can join me in thanking uh, Mrs. Leader for her uh, Chester Session presentation today. Thank you. Thank you for having me and some really great questions. And uh, it was a pleasure to have have uh, have joined you this morning and continued blessings on your fasting journey towards the the incarnation. <laughs>